maybe five years ago, a gentleman contacted me and said he'd like to see a particular space on midway down on the second or third deck, if I recall. It was not open to the public. And we get these requests all the time. And we have volunteers who literally will do everything in their power to take a former midway sailor down to a space for any number of reasons, or at least get close, even when they're not necessarily, uh, certainly not open to the public and maybe not borderline safe. But uh, with two hands and a flashlight and the buddy system, we've been able to do that many times. In this particular case, he and about 10 buddies were, wanted to come back for the first time since 1990. Uh, I'm teeing you up, Carl. And uh, first time since 1990, they wanted to bring their families to show them a particular space. We said, sure. And we explained um, to the engineering department, could we clean it up a little bit and get a couple of light bulbs working and so on. Well, they mobilized for six months and, and damn near turned it into an exhibit. Uh, in terms of stripping things, uh, grinding metal down, down to bare metal, repainting, making things safe, clearing out junk and so on so that these 10 men and their families could uh, spend a few minutes there. They came aboard. Many of them were covered in burn scars. First time aboard in 20, 15, 25 years, 15, 18 years. Their families all stayed maybe five paces behind them. They all walked together as they walked down the passageway. Some of them glanced over in, in side passageways. Others kept their eyes straight ahead. They knew exactly where they were going. Um, again, the families were very, very quiet, mostly spouses, not too many kids that I remember. Uh, we turned the corner and down a ladder, um, and they went to a place. They all stood there and stopped, almost in unison, almost like a marching band. And, and one man I'll never forget um, started to say, this is the place. And almost all of them started crying. The families took almost another step back. They were members of the Flying Squad. And Carl's probably going to tell you about, or any of our speakers can tell you about the Flying Squad, the first responders, uh, where a horrific uh, pair of explosions took place on this very ship, just about below where we are tonight. Uh, and the horrific things they had to do uh, to uh, get things under control, uh, pull their, their burned comrades out. Several died. Uh, other sailors, what they did from an uh, emergency uh, situation, how everybody mobilized. And that's just one example of what takes place on a Navy ship, unfortunately, hopefully not too often, not just on Midway, but on Navy ships uh, around the world, certainly throughout our Navy and, and, and so on. Uh, so that was about as, not, about as much as I needed to know uh, in, in terms of what some of these young men that I would otherwise pass in the grocery store in aisle seven down the vegetable aisle and have no idea what they endured or what they did. Uh, it's just, it's just, and that's just not unique to Midway by any stretch of the imagination. So with that as a warm-up act, uh, we are going to get started. We have three speakers tonight. Uh, I'm going to introduce them all right now, but only one's going to come up to really kick things off, so I'm going to do it a little bit in reverse order. So John Jondahl, wherever you are on your feet. John served in the Navy as an machinist, um, aviation machinist mate. Did you write Everybody see him back here? He's kind of back here in the dark a little bit. Uh, after the Navy, he became the assistant fire chief for the San Diego Fire Rescue Department for 37 years. This guy knows fire, you know, with a Navy background. He was, yes. He was on the front lines. Uh, from, a, from fire control to helicopter operations to hazardous material control. Uh, he has a unique perspective, both from a Navy perspective as well as uh, what dangers and risks we all face, our neighborhoods face, and what those first responders in San Diego are doing, and the partnership that Midway has with those first responders. He was also uh, founder of the San Diego Fire Rescue Foundation uh, and has been a docent since 2007. Great partner, great resource for Midway, John Jondahl. There you are, Dan, on your feet. He's only been here, he, uh, let me back up. Engineering department hired, joined Midway in April 2018. His first public presentation, even worse, his family is here. So be nice during the Q&A, no pressure. Uh, it's also being videotaped, Dan. I don't know that I told you that. Sorry about that. Then it goes online, but hey, welcome aboard Midway. <laughs> Dan did well, or Len did well. Dan's gonna do it in every, even better. He is Damage Control Master Chief. He served in the Navy for 32 years. Um, listen to the ships he served aboard and think in terms of damage control. USS Nimitz, 
USS Clifton Sprague, USS Acadia, USS Ramsey, USS Pluck, love that name for a ship, just that <laughs> Navy ship, USS Esteem, a close second, USS Cowpens, eh, not so much, USS Pearl Harbor, USS George Washington, USS Nimitz, big time decks. Now either this guy is really good or he can't keep a job. We're not sure which, but he finally found his way to Midway uh, and he's done just a great job for us in a very few months assessing and identifying you know, different points of risk and, and threat, if you will, that we need to be aware of as a museum that's open 363 days a year. Uh, once he retired, uh, he became a trainer, damage control trainer for the Navy, which tells you something despite his inability to keep a job. Um, and, and again, he joined us in, in uh, April of this year, and he's been a great asset already. And it's, he's going to share a little bit about what takes place out there on the uh, deep, deep blue ocean uh, today. Uh, finally, you, I think many of you have met him or heard him up on the stage before, Carl Zingheim. On your feet, Carl, ship's historian, <laughs> founding ship's historian. Carl, along with me, and I think uh, David Hansen all started volunteering in about 1996. Uh, he teaches courses in uh, Cold War history. He's appeared on the TV show Dogfights as a content expert. He is a Naval Academy graduate. He is an amazingly arcane, obscure historian. No matter what question you ask, you're going to get 22 minutes of relevant material and backstory from Carl. The meeting's over. He's still going. It's, it's just, just amazing. The thing that worries us most, and, and this flight or the uh, fire suit over here gives me the willies. Carl has this thing about costumes and Comic Con, you know, costumes that move, you know, independent of him and so on. Uh, a, a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of interests, uh, who really can share a lot uh, in terms of Midway's history, no matter what the topic is. And certainly tonight, I know he's got a great presentation for you. So, with that, let me bring up to the stage Carl Zingheim. Well, that's quite an introduction. The purpose uh, of my presentation tonight really is to define what the threat is that not just the firefighters and damage control personnel on our ships have to face, but the entire crew. The problem with fighting and dealing with a fire at sea is that you're contained with it. There's no place to evacuate to. You can't flee from a fire afloat. And so the purpose for my introduction here is to help establish the problems that are faced with real world examples, including on the Midway, that our other speakers are going to address in much greater detail. And so with that, let's talk about what the nature of firefighting would be on something as busy as an aircraft carrier. And it's appropriate that we're having something like this on a carrier because, frankly, a great deal of the advances that we have enjoyed in the last 50 years in firefighting afloat have largely been driven by what has happened aboard aircraft carriers. A carrier is basically a contained disaster waiting to happen. It just requires the alignment of a few problems and you've got yourself a very serious problem. And we're going to see some examples of that. But the real reason that this is being driven through with carrier aviation is because the nature of carrier aviation requires the operation and the exposure to all kinds of dangerous materials. There's a lot of energy involved in moving hurtling pieces of machinery in tight spaces, working with explosive fuels that are designed to explode to produce those velocities for those hurtling pieces of machinery. There are also, as warplanes, war designed to deploy, drop, or fire things that are supposed to explode and also become hurtling pieces of machinery in their own right. And we'll see some examples where that type of dynamic worked against us once in a while. So it's no surprise then that carriers are really the genesis for true revolutions in firefighting and other damage control measures afloat. This certainly dates back to at least the Second World War, because at that point, we were operating with high-performance high aircraft. We've gotten past the biplane era. We're now in the 1940s. We've got high-performance aircraft that are employing 100-octane aviation gasoline. 
Gasoline's designed to explode. That's what causes the pistons in your car to function. That's what causes the pistons in these aircraft to turn over, just like our R2800 display right there. You need a lot of motive force to get that thing to do its job. Trouble is, if you take it outside of the tight confines of how it's supposed to perform, it's going to turn on you. In this example, we have an aircraft that had a serious fuel leak when it made a violent stop, as all arrested landings are, and this fuel splashed onto the hot engine manifold, and next thing you know, you've got yourself a, a miniature conflagration. That's a term you're gonna be hearing quite a bit tonight. A miniature conflagration on top of a flight deck that is made of Douglas fir. And so you could see that in the Second World War era, before the Midway class introduced the armored flight deck, you had a lot of problems with fire topside on an aircraft carrier. Unfortunately, though, it didn't necessarily get better with steel flight decks or moving away from a high octane aviation gasoline to jet fuel. This is taken on the Midway, 1952. This, uh, of course, is a still from a famous uh, montage of uh, photographs as well as uh, from a slightly different angle on the catwalk, uh, some film footage that has been used in the innumerable aviation war movies showing a crash on a flight deck. This is the famous ramp strike of uh, Commander George Duncan in 1952. A ramp strike is where an aircraft approaching the back of the carrier over the fantail strikes the very after end of the flight deck for whatever reason. There are all kinds of reasons why an aircraft would do that. In this particular case, Commander Duncan was flying an F-9F Panther jet, just like the one we have uh, at the top of the bunny slope leading to uh, back down to the hangar deck. And his aircraft lost altitude rapidly at the last possible moment and more or less bodily hit the edge of the flight deck at the ramp, causing the aircraft to not only explode, as you see, but to actually split into two pieces. Fortunately for Commander Duncan, he was in a design where he was at the forward extremity of the aircraft and it split right behind him. And so most of his aircraft tumbled along with him. The nose section separated and he still strapped inside his seat, tumbling end over end all the way down to basically lining up with the island. So those of you who are quite familiar with our flight deck know that's a pretty long roll to be tumbling around inside. And so what we have here is uh, uh, D damage control team eight taking care of the spread out fire from the, the part of the plane that came across the flight deck. And here's this rescue crew running in and being relieved to see a rather agitated George Duncan still strapped inside. They were able to extract him. He had a few burns, of course, but he was very much alive and everyone was tremendously grateful that he was able to survive. By the way, the rest of the aircraft tumbled down into the fantail. So where we line up for our luncheons every day was a tangled mass of uh, flaming aluminum and jet fuel. That very same fantail. Some 32 years later, another pilot on the Midway was not so fortunate. A young lieutenant named Thomas Doyle, who was on his first overseas deployment, was attempting to bring back his A7 Corsair in a low fuel state and facing Midway's infamous pitching deck. Things were just not aligning for him and he brought her in anyway and unfortunately the timing was off and his A7 also struck the ramp. This picture in the, it's from a, a string of photos in the sequence actually shows the wings and the forward uh, two thirds of the A7 tumbling over like a shoulder roll right in front of where the E2 is, is parked and in the sky in the background that's actually the severed tail with a jet engine that is still producing thrust. So his ta severed tail section is actually rocketing upwards while the rest of the aircraft is tumbling across the entire length of the angled deck to tumble into the sea ahead. Unfortunately, Lieutenant Tom, uh, Doyle did not survive this crash. So we do indeed tread upon hallowed decks on the Midway. Right where we have our trap talk is where all this occurred.
So we do have a fabulous museum, but it's opportunities like this that can help us remember that we do tread upon hallowed decks on this ship. You could also run into problems just because somebody else is deliberately trying to cause mayhem for you. And so in this case, this is a rare example, fortunately, of enemy inflicted damage on an aircraft carrier and what can ensue. This is a photograph of the USS Bunker Hill after she received the second of two kamikaze hits on her packed flight deck while uh, operating near Okinawa in the last phases of World War II. More than 500 men perished in this uh, conflagration. In fact, the damage that had been in, uh, entailed in attacks just like this on our earlier wooden deck carriers forced the Navy, when they were rebuilding these ships, to take the ready rooms and put them down below the hangar deck. That's why later versions of these Essex-class wartime carrier designs during the Cold War have an escalator built on the side because they lost the ready rooms through uh, crashing ordnance and aircraft learned in World War II. Fortunately, Midway with an armored flight deck never had to worry about that, and that's why the ready rooms are still retained on the gallery deck, even though Midway is only of a slightly younger vintage than the Essex class. You could also run into problems because of operational tempo. The 1960s turned out to be a traumatic period for the carrier force when it came to damage control. And it all came down to the operational tempo we were attempting to maintain while conducting an extended bombing campaign against North Vietnam. There were three carrier conflagrations off North Vietnam in the late 1960s, and all of them in different ways were tied to the operational tempo. The first one we had was in October of 1966 on board USS Oriskany. What had happened was in those early stages of the air campaign called Rolling Thunder, there was an emphasis on night operations, night raids, and in those days that involved having to use a lot of airdrop flares from aircraft. The flare was basically a canister that had a little explosive charge on it so it would pooch out the uh, parachute that it would dangle from while it would also ignite brightly burning magnesium and other components to provide a bright light as it was uh, gliding down with the parachute. Trouble was they had lots and lots of these stacked around and they were running out of places to conveniently store them between operations. On that October morning, two young sailors were detailed to take a whole series of, tro of trolleys filled with these magnesium flares and store them into a compartment, which for, in our case, if it were our hangar deck, would be just right over next to where the steam accumulator was. It's a very similar layout. So these two young men are thinking they're doing a good job. They're just emptying the carts one after the other, but as you would have it, one sailor had to get farther and farther away as they were emptying each successive trolley and train. So what, what do you think they did? They started tossing them. You can't reach anymore, but I gotta keep doing the job. Unfortunately, there was a bad throw or a bad catch, but a lanyard got accidentally pulled on one of these uh, flares that didn't have a safety pin reinserted, and the kids heard a pop and a hiss and in a panic, the young man who uh, bungled the catch picked it up and threw it into the compartment with several hundred others just like it and dogged the door down and yelled, fire. Unfortunately, he should have just had the presence of mind to walk over to the elevator opening and simply tossed it into the sea or at the very least roll it into the middle of the hangar deck and then the hangar repair party would have an interesting firefighting exercise, trying to take care of what we call a Delta class fire. He didn't do that. It started to ignite the others in there and we had a tremendous explosion and overpressure where superheated gases went through this compartment which was not designed as a magazine. It went back through the ventilation system the other way into a whole series of staterooms where the pilots slept. Net result, we had 44 men lost 
in this fire. Most of them were air crew. This particular picture shows the desperate measures they were taking to try and grapple with this carrier fire that's deep within the heart of the carrier itself. In fact, what we have here is an instance where one officer survived in his stateroom even though everything else around him was burning because he had one of the few staterooms that still had a porthole. So he pried open the porthole, stuck his head out to breathe, wrapped himself up as best he could with damp towels and such, and he caught the attention of a young sailor on the flight deck two levels above. And so they passed a hose down to him. He pulled it into the porthole, and every so often he'd water down everything in his small stateroom when it got too hot. The men in the neighboring staterooms didn't have that, and they all perished. So eventually that man was, was able to be saved, but only because of an accident of architecture. So this is a case where my sense as being a former division officer is a nightmare where you, your kids are doing something, taking care of a job, they think they're doing a fine job and it turns out they're doing something dangerous. And in this case, several men lost their lives. The following July, the carrier Forrestal was also conducting operations off North Vietnam. And again, the op tempo meant that a lot of corners had to be cut so we could constantly keep the missions flying. One problem that was unique to the Forrestal situation was, was that we were going through so much ordnance during the bombing campaigns, we were actually taking up old, outdated ammunition left over from previous conflicts and bolting them onto our aircraft to drop on Southeast Asia. In the case of the Forrestal, the day before, she received a load from the uh, ammunition ship Diamond Head of 1952 manufactured 1,000-pound bombs with an outdated uh, explosive inside. Part of the problem with these 1,000-pound thin-skin bombs was is that they were rather haphazardly stored in Guam and Subic Bay in tropical weather, and the ordnance officer actually saw a crystallized explosive oozing out of the interior of the casings on there. Anyone who's worked in the ordnance field knows that when you start to see degraded ammunition or degraded propellant, it's unstable and you, it will react in ways that it's not supposed to under normal conditions. They were so bad, the ordnance officer tried to refuse delivery and tried to give them back to the Diamond Head. And Diamond Head says, sorry, we can't do that. They brought it all the way up to Captain Bowling's attention, and he basically had to come to the conclusion that if we chuck this ordinance over the side, we're not going to have anything for tomorrow's strike. We need to keep up the, uh, the combat tempo. So he reached a compromise. Shows you how bad these bombs were. He wouldn't even allow them to go down in the magazine. So since they were going to use them in the following morning strike, he decided to have them stored in the bomb alley just outboard of the island. Just like we have our little bomb alley where people wait to go up in the island tour, that's where you stole ordnance when the ship is in combat operations. That's the only place the Forest Hall's captain can think of to safely store these dangerous bombs in the interim. So, following morning, everybody's up. They've got a full day's air schedule worked out. They've got the pack all the way aft, fighters, bombers, and such, loaded with these fragile bombs. As luck would have it, in that July morning, an F-4 Phantom over on the opposite corner from this photograph you see here was warming up, shifting over from outside power to internal electrical power when a power surge caused a Zuni rocket pod to launch. And that rocket shot diagonally from the corner of the flight deck on the starboard side right over to where you basically see that fireball. That used to be an A-4. It didn't explode, but it had enough kinetic energy that it ruptured the fuel tanks and caused it to shatter, and flaming rocket fuel ignited all that uh, spilled fuel. You see that A4, the third one over from the right? That's John McCain's A4. He had just shimmied his way out of there just a second or so before this picture was snapped. The other trouble was the ordinance was now exposed to all this heat in just an instant after this still was taken, the first of several thousand pound explosions took place, eventually wiping out the original firefighting parties that were sent. Now, I remind you, this is a generation after World War II. The Navy had gotten kind of relaxed 
about training standards, and we only had specialized damage control teams who were fully versed in how to handle hoses, wear OBAs and such. The rest of the crew, not so much. What do you do when you've got an entire flight deck, not only on fire, but exploding, and all your firefighters are casualties? You have to pick up what equipment's left and figure out how to use it. Fortunately for subsequent generations of sailors, mine included, I'm sure many of you sitting here tonight probably remember the training film the Navy produced based on footage of this fire called Trial by Fire. One of the embarrassing things you could see are crewmen trying to figure out how to load an OBA oxygen canister into the breathing apparatus without even wearing them. Crews trying to lay down foam to knock down uh, an oil fire as it's advancing up the flight deck, and then handy helpers with a hose team right behind them promptly washing the foam away because they didn't know. And so a lot of harsh lessons were learned because of the confluence of bad luck, bad equipment, and basically having the, to deal with an operational tempo that required the, the, a lot of corner cutting. This lesson had to be underlined again in January of 1969. After losing 134 men on the Forrestal fire, the lessons were just starting to sink in when the nuclear carrier Enterprise, who was on her way to North Vietnam, was stopping by the Hawaiian Islands to conduct what they called an ORI, an Operational Readiness Inspection, basically a dress rehearsal for conducting the very same combat operations they were going to be doing in Southeast Asia. Well, another problem happened. They were, someone was using a device called a huffer, and it's just a little cart that you plug into an aircraft and it had an exhaust port. You know, it's not run off the ship's energy, it's run by its own little motor, and it has to have an exhaust. The trouble was this huffer was parked right next to another infamous Zuni pod Zuni rocket pod on an F-4 Phantom, and it cooked off the ordnance because it got too hot. That rocket shot across, and here we go again. It's forest all, all over again. It hits another aircraft, exploding uh, bombs and fuel all over the place. However, the Enterprise crew was ready for this, and they were able to react rapidly and get other aircraft out of the way. It was still a very bad fire. This is a full conflagration. The casualty rate came down to 28 people. It's too many to lose, but it's not an exact repeat of what happened with Forrestal. So these three, this trio of disasters in 66, 67, and again, the beginning of 69, told the Navy, we've got to find another way to do our business. And they did. We now have universal training in basic fire control, firefighting procedures and other damage control procedures across the fleet. We've introduced new equipment that can attack a fire. We've got fixed firefighting systems for flight decks now, so you don't have to rely on trying to rebuild a hose team to go after it. We've got ordnance that's actually designed to resist heat for protracted periods of time. And if it does cook off, these bombs, believe it or not, are designed to explode radially, not in a universal circle. So in my time, we were trained to approach a bomb head on, because if it does cook off, it probably, probably, isn't going to be shooting towards you as well. So all these lessons are all incorporated with examples written in blood. And it's very fortunate that our Navy in this time has only had very few instances in which they've had to practice these new techniques. One conflagration that did occur was in 1987 when the guided missile frigate Stark was on uh, escort and patrol duty in the Persian Gulf and an Iraqi jet which was going after tankers in the t infamous tanker wars between Iran and Iraq launched an anti-ship missile that wound up hitting the Stark instead. The one fortunate thing in that entire incident was that the missile's warhead failed to explode and yet its energy and worse its burning solid fuel caused enough of a conflagration that it, they came close to losing the Stark. Sometimes your own equipment can also turn on you. In uh, the early 1990s, Battleship Iowa was conducting a live fire shoot with her main battery, and she had a problem 
with one of her 16-inch uh, shells. And somehow, they haven't really pinned down the true source of the detonation, but her 16-inch black powder charges cooked off while the gun breach was still open. These are just, this is a medium explosive that's designed to take a projectile that weighs nearly a ton and hurl it up to 26 miles away. That's a lot of energy packed into a small space that's supposed to be confined within the, the firing breach of a 16-inch shell. Trouble is, that breach was open, and so guess where all that uh, uh, incandescent gas vented? Right back into the gun chamber. And so what we have here is a picture of the damage control, to control crews outside attempting to get the fire under control, cool down the surfaces so they could send in rescue and recovery parties inside the turret. So we're very fortunate then in not having to relearn these lessons as frequently as our forebearers did. But hopefully in this series that I've just shown you, you can get an appreciation for what the nature of the challenge of dealing with fires at sea is really all about. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you Carl, give us 10 or 15 minutes. 28 minutes. Not a single note. Not a single note. Classic Singheim. Welcome to our world aboard Midway. Well done. Dan, come on up. Dan Basemi is going to share a little bit more about what's taking place in the modern Navy, 30 some years in the Navy, Master Chief Damage Control. If there's ever an expert to share with us tonight, it's certainly Dan. Well, I only have five minutes because Carl ate up on my, all my time. <laughs> all right, I'm going to cover a couple things. Uh, some of my experience with fires on board my ship of 30 years. And then uh, something I, I was thinking, what, what do I want to talk about? And uh, something I found interesting are, are firefighting tactics uh, now and then. I was stationed on board uh, USS Nimitz in 1980. That was a scary night walking down the pier, checking on board there. But the Nimitz was my, uh, you heard him mention the Nimitz twice when he was uh, reading my bio. I reported on Nimitz 1980 as an E1, and I reported back in 2010 as an E9. So that was pretty neat. So I got to get all my revenge. <laughs> but I had a, it was the middle of the night, my first fire, I just got off watch. And uh, I noticed pressure dropped in the fire main. So we went to inspect all the fire pumps. I sent my watches out, and I checked JP5 pump room number two. And I went down there, and uh, the windows, the JP5 pump room is the jet fuel. And I'm looking at the windows. It's just pure black smoke, and my adrenaline's going. So I pick up the phone. I'm going to do this perfect. And I, I knew this is when I, I I joked too much because I called Central. I said, Toro, this is HT3 Busumi. I have a class Charlie Fire in the pump room. And I need you to call it away. Toro said, are you joking? Are you serious? You know how much trouble I can get in? So I spent five minutes trying to convince him I had a fire on an aircraft carrier in a JP5 pump room. So it didn't stop there. I grabbed one of my watches. We put on an OBA, so we're, we're running around sounding like and looking like Dark Vader. And we get down there, and uh, we had to secure the power. It's Charlie Fire, electric pump on fire. And we're standing there, and this is how green we were. We're arguing who's going to turn off the power, because we know we got to shut the power off, but we're scared. So we're, we're, we're fighting and arguing, and I finally reached over and turned it off. And I didn't get shocked, and I was all happy. <laughs> so then we run to the CO2 hose reel. And it's uh, two 50-pound bottles and a hose reel. I, I grab it, run over, and I'm standing at the pump, and I'm, I'm telling my, uh, my friend, the watch center, to activate the system. So it's not, it's not working. And it's not working, and I'm turning them. I'm saying, what's going on? What's going on? And he's cursing and just cursing and, and cussing. and. So I run over there and I'm looking at him and I'm like, what, what is going on? 
and he's, he's looking at it and he's holding the, the tag that you initial when you do maintenance on the system and he's like, I did maintenance on this last. So I started cussing and cursing <laughs> at him because it didn't work. So we, um, we had to carry six 15 pound CO2 bottles down there to extinguish that fire. Um, and the fire, uh, it, I don't know what happened, but it took like 15 minutes to get that fire called away. I don't think Toro ever really believed me, but we finally put the fire out and then the fire party showed up. <laughs> uh, my next fire on the, mid, uh, on the Nimitz, it w wasn't a good day for me. I lost my uh, best friend that day. 14 sailors died May 26, 1981. We had a EAB6 crash. Um, and 20 minutes, uh, 28 minutes after the fire went off, the, the same scenario, a sea sparrow cooked off. And with that explosion, two more sea sparrows and one sign winder cooked off. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't a good day. It was a long night. It happened at midnight. We were going to pull in the next day in uh, Fort Lauderdale, so we're all excited about getting some real liberty. So that's when I realized fire is no joke. So my next fire, I was stationed on board a couple minesweepers. Minesweepers are made out of wood. We used to call them Duralogs. Um, <laughs> The engines and the fuel lines leak so bad, we always joked we could put uh, a suction into the bilge and still run the engines. Uh, so I, I, I had a fire on the uh, USS Pluck, and you know, when a fire starts, it's like when you, you're lighting your grill in the backyard and you throw the match and it's burning your eyebrows. It just it startles you. So I had a fire break out, and uh, it just, the training kicked in, I activated my extinguisher, PKP, and I, I put out the fire, and then I was a war hero. Uh, my second fire on board, uh, my second mine sweep, I was in the Persian Gulf, it's 110 degrees out there. Uh, I was on the forecastle, and I hear this, it sounded like a CO2 bottle lit off. And I'm like, who is lighting off a CO2 bottle up on the bridge? So I run up there, and the gunner's mates, no offense, gunner's mates, but the gunner's mates forgot to put the flares away. So a flare got so hot up there, it went off, and it was zooming around the bridge and, and engulfed the whole, fire, the whole bridge. The whole bridge was on fire. So we called it away. I got some uh, fire parties up there, two host teams, and then I learned when you see a sailor finally get the fight of fire with a hose, they, don't, uh, they do not want to stop. The fire was out, the space was desmoked, and they were still hosing everything down. I had to, had to walk up there, I looked around, I was like, water off! And they shut the water off, and they seen parades and medals and all that gleaming in their eye. But it was neat to see them finally get to do what we train. And they were, they were all pumped up, screaming and hollering like they were at a rodeo. <laughs> the next fire, I wasn't on board the George Washington when they had the fire. Now, they, there's an actual picture of them uh, trying to set fire boundaries and keep it, it cool. It was a fire. It was a fire that started because we misstowed mis some flambeau liquid. As some sailors were taught or told to to remove some liquid, and they didn't want to carry it out, so they opened up a vent plenum and stashed 90 gallons in there. But the sailors that put the, the fuel in there would also smoke down there, and they would throw their cigarettes in the vent plenum exhaust. Uh, the fire started 12 hours later. Um, they, they, they successfully extinguished the fire uh, it cost us $70 million, but it was a, I always called it a great fire because we didn't lose no lives, 
but it, it opened up a problem and eyes that we, were, we had an issue with aircraft carriers in our zone inspection program, our hazmat stowage programs, and uh, it was something we had to fix. One, one thing I did learn, because I'm a DC man, I went and interviewed all the firefighters, locker leaders, and I wanted to learn everything they, they experienced during this fire. Uh, one thing they, I think, I think there was divine intervention there were some sailors trapped in the aft JP5 pump room and they were trying to get them out and they were stuck down there. They used all their EBDs and they were just stuck down there. One of the attempts to get them out was we climbed down in a shaft alley and they were using an exothermic cutting outfit which cuts through steel and trying to, now listen to me, they're trying to cut into a JP5 pump room where all the valves for most of your tanks in the aft ship are all connected together but they could not get it to work. They tried, they tried, and it's very, we're very lucky that they didn't. So uh, out of this fire, we stepped up the zone inspection programs, which we inspect all spaces every quarter, um, control hazmat, and so there's some of my fires. So, one thing I thought was amazing when I joined 1980, I thought, oh, this is going to be neat. I'm going to be, uh, learn how to be a firefighter and learn all this firefighting gear. So we got here, and we had hoses and, and nozzles and water, but we didn't have no ensembles, and, and we didn't have SCBAs. We were still using A4 chemical canisters, and we knew the outside firefighters were using SCBAs and ensembles. and and we were like, man, I wish we, wish we had that gear. So the picture you, you see here I wanted to show is firefighting then and now. You can see uh, sailors there. You see the top right, uh, he's in an OBA, but just dungarees. You have a sailor there, no shirt, short sleeves. Here's another picture. This is actually a uh, midway sailors fighting fire on board the ship here and the the you know i'm looking at this picture the first thing that pops out of me is the is the guy with no breathing apparatus but if you look at the dungarees in the bottom right his name stenciled is not proper it's uh that's what popped out of me yeah not that he couldn't breathe but his pants weren't stenciled correctly but again you look at the sailors and they're, they're fighting fires, 1,000, 2,000 degrees, and T-shirts. Now that, that is, that's guts. That's, that's tough. Here we go, this is another fire um, that was on board here. You can see some of the, uh, as a DC man, as soon as I look at it, there's no smoke boundaries. Uh, personnel are not dressed out properly. Uh, you have people in the smoke boundaries. But again, these sailors were brave doing what they could do with what they had. So on the left there, that's an A3 OBA. I actually uh, used one of those in 1980. Um, the middle picture, top picture you see there, that's an A4 OBA. Again, you see short sleeve shirts. Um, and then we, we call them Fozzy Bear Gloves. Down at the bottom, we hated these things. Uh, there was no dexterity. But that's all we had. And again, we envied civilian firefighters who had state-of-the-art gear. And on the right there, you can see that's our modern-day firefighter that we finally figured it out and started issuing the ships the gear we need to properly protect our firefighters. So I came in 1980. I'm being trained for 10 years how to fight fires. I'm thinking, I really know what, what's going on. So in 1991, 91, we, we started testing our tactics. We started testing our tactics, our tactics, and what we discovered was our tactics were incorrect. The way we were attacking fires and the way I was being taught for 10, 11 years were, were not correct. And we completely rewrote our, our NSTM, which is NAV Ships Tech Manual, 
on our, we call it NSTM 555. It's our Bible of how to fight fires on board a Navy ship. So what the Navy did, it was a great thing they did. They took the, uh, it's a World War II ship, USS Shadwell, LSD-15, and they started burning fires on there and measuring temperatures, took a bunch of scientists down there, and we were figuring out um, how hot it got, how fast the fire would spread, what were the temperatures, and actually, what are the temperatures of the firefighters? Um, I had buddies go down there, and they were probed, just like a Cartman on South Park. Uh, they had probes in them measuring the core of their body, their skin temperature, the atmosphere. So they were, they were measuring temperatures everywhere. Our tactics in 1980, it was flooded. Uh, water on, two hose teams, and, and, and just drowned the fire. Like if we were in your backyard putting out a barbecue grill, just drowned it. And what, what we learned, those, all those tactics were incorrect. We were doing more harm to the firefighters than we were advancing to the fire. So what we discovered on the Shadwell after all those years, we discovered we needed a rapid response team. We learned that putting out the fire rapidly was more important than getting the fire party all dressed out. Our fire parties usually took 10 to 15 minutes to get dressed out at the repair locker, get all the way down to the scene. By that time, a fire on board the ship left alone, zero to 10 minutes can reach 1,000 degrees. 10 minutes to 20 minutes, it can reach 2,000 degrees. So we developed a rapid response team. No gear, run there, try to put it out while it's small, while the fire party at the same time is running to the locker, putting all the gear on, and then getting to the scene. So we would hit it in waves. Rapid response team, number one host, host team, number two host team. So what did we learn down there? We learned water management. Two hoses, too slow. We went back to single hose. Uh, we thought we thought just so much water being dumped into space would put out the fire, but it actually what we learned is using those tactics drove the fire party out of the space. So here's the question of the day. How many gallons of steam will one gallon of water produce? 1,700, that is the correct answer. Someone give that man a, a free beer. That is correct. So at 95, we, our nozzles on board are 95 gallons per minute. So what we learned was one gallon of water produced 1,700 gallons of steam. So if you let your nozzle run for one minute, that'll produce 161,500 gallons of steam. So you're, you're cooking yourself right out of the space. We also learned that there's a thermal layer. I know everyone here knows what a thermal layer is. That's where heat rises. I know everyone opens up their oven. That's, no, you open up your oven to check the turkey, do you stick your head right in there? No, you wait, you, you duck back, you let the thermal layer escape the oven, and then you go in and get the damn turkey. <laughs> so that, 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 that's, that's a thermal layer. So in a compartment we learned Advancing on the fire, if you go continuous water flow, you would generate all this steam and cook you. All heat rising, we were always teaching our sailors try to stay low below the heat because heat rises. Throwing water into the space would th swirl your thermal layer, create steam, and cook yourself right out of space. And we're not even to the seat of the fire yet. Um, and firefighters usually do more damage to the ship with their fires, and I seen it firsthand on the uh, minesweeper there, is once they get dumping water, they're happy. So firefighters do do a lot of damage. Out of that, we also learned our tactics. So we always wanted to direct attack. A direct attack is enter the space, find the seat of the fire, and then apply your water. 60 degree pattern, 30 degree pattern, several seconds on, several seconds, and then go water off. Uh, let your steam subside, do not disrupt your thermal layer, and then apply more water. Uh, fog attack is a, a different method. If you're in the space, it's too hot, 
you take your nozzle, 45 degree angle, six degree pattern, and two to three seconds, and we learned that a quick sh shot into the air would actually bring the temperature down and help you advance. So that's an indirect. Also, if you can't get to the seat of the fire, you can use in indirect or um, a fog attack to try to fight the fire from a distance. Then we have indirect attack. Indirect attack is how the George Washington put out their fire, which is open the hatch, or they open up manhole covers, stick in your nozzle in, and just let the water flow and then try to drown it out or smother it with steam. That would be an indirect tag. Now you're all qualified firefighters. <laughs> Thank you for your time and your support. So Dan, let me get this right. 10 ships, 87 fires. There's probably a reason you didn't keep a job very long. <laughs> These are tax dollars at work you know, with all the problems you guys have. No, seriously, you are heroes. It's just a re remarkable. I've got a whole slew of questions for you if we have time. And we will save some time for questions from the audience. Uh, Ivy and Laura, two ladies in white jackets, will be uh, floating around after John John Dahl uh, with some wireless microphones. So, uh, raise your hand and we'll get to as many as we can. John, where are you? Behind, Behind me. Come on up. Um, as I said earlier, uh, John's a docent, assistant fire chief for the uh, city of San Diego, uh, Navy veteran. Uh, we'll share with you a little bit about the great partnership that we've established over the years with the fire department and others to help make this museum safe. Thank you. Do we need a seventh inning stretch? Okay. All right, I'll blitz through this. Um, since Midway's uh, opening as a museum, it's become a pretty valuable resource to the fire rescue department. Uh, we've created kind of a symbiotic relationship where uh, we come in, we practice, and then when an incident occurs, it helps us actually uh, carry it out. So some of the, uh, some of the various entities that we've... Uh, We've sent on board Minway to, uh, to train our USAR team, Urban Search and Rescue, our Heavy Rescue team. Uh, they practice confined space entry and extrication, uh, shipboard firefighting, not so much on that, but uh, special training and rescue medics. Uh, we, those are called the STAR team. Uh, those are medics that are specially trained, and uh, they also train with the uh, police department in SWAT operations. And, um, they also uh, will get on a Coast Guard helicopter and they'll fly them out to cruise ships sometimes in the event that there's a uh, medical emergency on them. And the bomb squad and finally the lifeguard dive team has, has, has uh, dived underneath the, uh, the hull. So the skills that these groups learn, they're all perishable and they have to be renewed frequently. And uh, what they try to do is create a toolbox of various techniques uh, procedures that they can grab from to adequately address any kind of an incident. So before Midway, shipboard training uh, opportunities were, were uh, pretty few and far between. Uh, we used to use the USNS ships when they would dock, oh, that way, when they would dock over at the uh, Broadway Pier, and that worked out pretty well. Uh, the, we've used the hospital ship Mercy, that was, um, that was pretty good. And uh, ships under construction at uh, NASCO. Um, but there's always limited access. You don't want to impact their hours of operation. And parking is usually restricted for apparatus. And all of the training needs need to be repeated at least three times because the fire department consists of uh, three platoons, so all of them on alternating days. But uh, we did inherit an environmentally friendly uh, um, uh, fire trainer when we took over, when the city took over the southern 67 acres of the old NTC. Um, that was built by Cubic, powered by propane. It was a basic compartment fire trainer. And uh, it came with two engineers and a huge budget. And no annual um, allotment to uh, pay for it. We managed to keep it going for a couple of years, but finally had to give it up. And it's being um, leased out to a private company now to certify merchant seamen. But when Midway provided, uh, opened, it provided a vast new potential for training. 
So we all know the story on January 10th, 2004. I was there. I was, uh, I was in my office, and I saw in the news that the Midway was going to be uh, relocated to uh, uh, the pier here. And so I got in my car, drove down, and I was parked on Harbor Drive and watched the tugs push it against the, uh, the pier. Um, then it became uh, a question of which authority was going to have jurisdiction for the fire uh, codes and ordinances. Um, the Coast Guard, who we thought was going to take responsibility for it, says, yeah, it's not a, it's not a seagoing vessel. It's not our responsibility. And the uh, port district doesn't have a fire department, so it fell to San Diego. So the question was how to apply the uniform building and fire codes uh, to a ship. And um, most of the building codes and, and fire codes apply to either buildings or structures. And the definition of a structure is that which is built or constructed, so it pretty much covers everything. <laughs> So first thing we had to do is establish a type of occupancy. And um, just so you know this, in case this comes up at your next cocktail party, uh, the Midway is essentially an A3 occupancy. So A stands for assembly, and this is the third category. So it's the very same uh, occupancy as like an art museum. And uh, it has a sub-occupancy. So the main occupancy is an assembly, sub-occupancy education, uh, the same as uh, K through 12. Ordinarily, you might look to other jurisdictions with similar conditions, and uh, we did look at the Hornet and the Intrepid. Well, the Intrepid's in New York, and um, they have a different set of codes and ordinances, and uh, I'm not quite sure how they do the rest of it, but uh, it, anyway, it didn't look anything like uh, what we would, would do on the West Coast. And the Hornet, uh, poor old Hornet, uh, it's kind of like an orphan up there, and uh, they hadn't done much either. But uh, Pete Clayton, who was the first uh, engineer on board the Midway, um, he uh, organized a uh, tour for the San Diego command staff and uh, took us all through the, uh, through the ship. And it was, matter of fact, he was the one that uh, got me interested in volunteering. Uh, I just happened to mention that I was going to be retiring in a few years. And he said, well, you need to come over here. And I did. So, uh, but um, I did. Uh, I did immediately recognize that uh, we had the potential on board the Midway of literally thousands of guests coming on board every year. Now, who would have ever thought that it would <laughs> not only surpass thousands, but ten thousands and hundreds of thousands and end up in the millions? So, but I was, uh, I was entitled to that one. So, um, when we looked at it, it's, it kind of treated like a high-rise building. So, one American Plaza is the tallest building in California outside of Los Angeles or San Francisco, and that's 500 feet high. So if the midway was stood on end, it would be almost twice as tall as that. So it's a fairly significant uh, situation and fairly large uh, occupancy. So through negotiations with the midway's uh, fire protection consultants and the fire marshal's office, you know, we arrived at what we have. So. Uh, bunny slopes, exiting, uh, sprinklers in all of the areas that are regularly habited. And it's an ongoing process based on the improvements that are made. As an example, uh, when they opened the uh, uh, junior skipper or the little skippers program, the, they had to uh, make quite a few improvements in, the, in that area as well. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is the concept of hazard versus risk, and that's what we look at when we're determining uh, what the fire codes and how they're going to be applied. So a hazard, uh, strictly speaking, is any agent or condition that can, uh, can cause harm. So electricity, hazardous materials, potential for fire, all hazards. Uh, risk is the probability that someone is going to be injured by them. So you don't always have the ability to do anything about the hazard. I mean, it's there. You have to deal with it. But you do have quite a bit of latitude in terms of how much risk you're going to uh, uh, assume. So a little history. Uh, 1969 in the city of San Diego, and actually it wasn't just San Diego. It was uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the profession. There was very little risk management. Um, and quite frankly, they used to be a lot more tolerant of accidents. It was just like, oh, yeah, those things happen. Uh, and we relied mostly on rules of thumb, previous experience, and physical conditioning. And 
quite frankly, it was kind of a macho attitude, but you know, when you're young, you kind of like that. <laughs> so there was uh, no extrication training, no rescue, and um, well, we did have a little bit of rescue training. It consisted of a three quarter inch manila line, or as we call it, a rope, and uh, a ladderman's belt. So a ladderman's belt was about, oh, it was made out of real heavy canvas, about four inches wide, had a couple of buckles on it. You'd fasten it around your waist, and then it had a hook. Uh, it looked like a large carabiner with a spring-loaded gate. And so um, you'd grab a hold of the hook, you'd take the manila line, you'd take a couple wraps in it, throw the end off the, off the side of the building or over the ladder, and away you go. So no fall protection or anything. Uh, in IDLH, IDLH is uh, immediately dangerous to life and health. Uh, that term didn't even exist in 1969. And uh, that's uh, what now governs the use of uh, self-contained breathing apparatus. Um, we had a lot of those atmospheres, but the use of self-contained breathing apparatus, even at that time, was kind of optional. And in some instances, it was even looked down upon because they thought that it took too much time to put it on, and you were just that was time better spent uh, running into the fire. So things began to change in the 70s, and there was a couple things that took place. Um, one, um, in California, uh, as a result of some large wildland fires, they created an organization called FireScope. And it was um, firefighting resources in California organized against potential emergencies. And uh, they created the first uh, FOG guide. FOG is Field Operations Guide. And it was generally directed towards wildland fires, since that's what they were dealing with at the time. But it standardized operations at the strategic and tactical level and placed all of those functions either within operations, planning, uh, logistics, or rudimentary training. Uh, things began to really accelerate when the feds got involved and the U.S. Forest Service, National Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, and Fish and Game created the National Wildland Coordinating Group. And um, Boise and Missoula, both are major research centers now for that organization. And uh, it was a comprehensive and scalable, it, and it expanded beyond uh, wildland fires to become all risk. And uh, it was expanded and everyone's reading off, the, made it so that everybody was reading off the same sheet of paper with common terminology and tactics. And it's currently still in use today. A new edition comes out every three years, and in the intervening three years, they use the administrative rulemaking procedure, and uh, they have um, hearings throughout the country, and, and they solicit uh, public input. Uh, this was readily adopted in the West, uh, not so eagerly adopted in the East. And then an event occurs that galvanized the entire movement. And uh, as I want to say, uh, things happen all the time that have never happened before. And in other words, you know, these are just some things that you just don't plan for. And in this particular case, it was on June 27th, 1980, in uh, the fire department in New York, Rescue 3 was called out to a high-rise fire in Harlem and during that incident, firefighter Jerry Frisbee became trapped by a fire on the seventh floor. And rescue crew three, using a one half inch diameter, 150, long, uh, 150 foot long nylon rope, probably the same type of rope you would use to tie your boat up to the dock, uh, lowered firefighter Larry Fitzpatrick down to pull out Frisbee, but under the combined weight of both men, the rope snapped and both plunged to their death. Uh, this was televised nationally and kind of spurred, um, uh, a, a resulted in a direct result of uh, the group fire service organizations uh, going to the National Fire Protection Association Technical Committee, committee and asking them to create some, uh, some standards. Um, the National Fire Protection uh, uh, Association is a private organization They're primarily concerned with uh, uh, building standards and fire protection devices, standpipes, sprinklers, uh, fire alarms, that sort of thing. Um, and they developed, uh, uh, they developed a new set of procedures, not necessarily tactics, but on equipment. And they mandated a 15 to 1 safety factor. So uh, if you had a working line and it was assumed that every, every human on that line uh, was allocated 300 pounds. So if you had a working line with a rescuer, and a victim, 600 pounds, 15 to one, 
9,000 pound braking strength. And um, the reason they picked 15 to 1, although it was 10 to 1 was an industry standard that had been used for decades, uh, if, you tie, if you tie knots in the rope, it reduces its strength by up to 30%, so 30% reduction that came with the 15 to 1. So what's the point? Well, today everything is more formalized, detailed, and involves more steps. In fact, I'm surprised I even survived long enough to, <laughs> to, uh, to experience that. But fire companies now have to follow a more formalized procedure, and that takes more people and more time. Uh, all San Diego Fire Rescue Department personnel that are assigned to a rescue unit or a USAR unit uh, are trained in rescue systems one, that's vertical rescue, high angle rescue, ropes and knots, harnesses, that sort of thing. And rescue systems two, uh, which is confined space, movement of heavy objects and shoring, and rescue systems three, which is a structural collapse specialist. And it takes a full response, uh, a full rescue response to extricate somebody on the uh, midway. So if you have a volunteer that trips and falls down a ladder below decks, or you have a guest that has a medical emergency up in the island, it's going to take a full rescue response. So that's, that's an engine company, a truck company. Uh, the truck companies are the ones with the aerial devices on them a rescue unit, an ambulance, and two battalion chiefs. Uh, one to be the incident commander and one to act as a safety officer. So that's a total of 14 personnel. Um, in the report of a fire, uh, Midway's treated like a high-rise response. So um, that gives uh, four engine companies, two trucks, a rescue rig, an ambulance, uh, two battalion chiefs, one light and air rig, and a total of 33 personnel. So uh, that's just initially. So these units come from as far, all the way out from Point Loma up to Hillcrest and maybe as far south as, uh, as Crosby Street. Uh, for a fire, IDLH, uh, immediately dangerous to life and health, requires a large quantity of SCBA bottles. And uh, these are 30 minute bottles. They're made out of aluminum. They're wrapped in carbon fiber. Uh, they say they're good for 30 minutes, but you're lucky to get 20 out of them. And uh, they're, they're pressurized to 4,500 PSI. So personal protective equipment with the SCBA weigh about 40 to 50 pounds. So that's coat, trousers, helmet, boots, gloves, Nomex hood, uh, spanner, flashlight. And you're insulated to protect you in the event that you get a flashover. Flashover is when the heat builds up and it finally uh, increases to the point where you've reached the ignition temperature of the combustibles in the room and they all uh, go up at once. Uh, but it holds in body heat as well. So we've created a two bottle rule. So if you're at a working fire, you've gone through two, oxygen, or two air bottles, um, you have to go to rehab uh, you have to get out of your PPE, uh, rehydrate yourself, get your vital signs taken by a medic, uh, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, and then co cool down before you can uh, resume work again. Then after four bottles, you're pretty much, uh, you're pretty much finished. So they constantly have to give in uh, more, more people. Okay, let's see. In the event that there's a fire on board, uh, usually what we like to do is use the ship's uh, personnel, but uh, if it's an IDLH atmosphere, that's, that's out, we're on our own. So um, they will use uh, flashlights, thermal imagers, and lifelines that they daisy chain together in order to find our way down there. So, oh, last part, consideration of how much water. Uh, goes in, has to come out also, although on a ship the size of the Midway, it's not such an issue, but on smaller vessels uh, and over in the Yacht Harbor, it is. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, John. Pastor Chief, first of all, I'm, I'm a retired lieutenant commander, so let's agree I know nothing. <laughs> Okay, back here is Repair One Fox. That was my repair locker for, from 1982 to 1985. And uh, in that effort, I had 120 guys with me. 
three of us or four of us were in khakis, the rest were in dungarees. When the bells went away, uh, we didn't allow them to go to their space and get different clothes. They showed up in dungarees, they showed up in khakis. I usually had a flight suit sitting by my desk down in the training office and I brought it up and we fought the fires. We fought two major arson fires forward of this area over here. Out of 120 guys, I would normally have 20 on hoses and we rotated the hose men about every two, three minutes because as you said, it gets thick and hot. It's also extremely heavy. And we would just rotate them out. So I have 20 guys on hoses. I have 60 guys taking water off the ship because the rules of the game were three to one. If I have three guys putting, one guy putting water on, I have to have three guys taking them off because I don't want to destabilize the ship. The other thing is, the water complicates the problems and it's just kind of fun. And along with that, if I have 10 guys on hoses, 30 guys taking water off, I have 20 guys giving my guys air. And I do that two different ways. I'm dealing with OBA canisters. We're watch it, walking OBA canisters up there by the truckload, literally, letting them go 15, 20, 30 minutes before we require them to change them out, throw them, throw them away. The other thing is we take our vents, our, our big blowers, and we don't suck air out of a compartment. We push it in. And yeah, the heat's coming out, but you gotta get to the fire. And my guys did a darn good job. I really like that. The other major fire we played with out of one fox was the uptake fire off the mess deck, which was right outside my office, the training office port side just after the aft mess line. And the reason we played as a major role up here was because the repair locker back there was actually in the space that was on fire and they were, put out, they were pushed out by the heat and it was fun. And I will tell you this, the guys who stood in the repair lockers on this ship, quite honestly, guys, they're heroes. You guys have no idea how much they trained, how much they put up with in training, how many times they were kicked in the rear end by inspection teams, by instructors, and whatever else. And when the real bell rang, they turned around and told those guys, hey, you know what? Stay out of the way. Let us handle it. And they did an extremely good job. And I can prove that. You know how good a job they did? The ship's still afloat. Thank you. Dan, did any of that surprise you? Any, any of that methodology? That, that, did, did any of that surprise you? No. The ratios and, and the methodology and that sort of thing? No. Back in the 80s? What did the, what did the other sailors do who didn't have a direct or even indirect role when something got really bad on, the ship, on any ship? Did they stay in their bunks? Did they keep flipping burgers? Did they keep baking bread? It, you know, what, what came to me right now was the GW fire. There's only so many people you can throw at the fire. Right. One of the things um, one, some of the firefighters t told me as they were running through the ship was there were still people at the gym working out and were upset they were being inconvenienced by the fire. Uh -huh. <laughs> But you know, you, you know the old term, uh, a complaining sailor is a happy sailor. So most of your sailors are always complaining. GQ, the training, the drills. Um, How often was, was there at sea training the, uh, beyond all, just you guys? I mean, ship-wide or? or Ship-wide, ship we have instructions that govern how many times we are supposed to do drills on import fire parties, how many times we're supposed to do flying squad drills, how many times the ship's supposed to go to general quarters and do main space fires. So we do have instructions that govern how many drills and, and to track it. And so, everyone knew ahead of time, so there was never any uh, pretend that it was for real. Everyone knew from the outset when a drill started, or we, did, not always? We, not always, they, they usually knew. Sailors are, are sneaky. They, they find out everything. If you got an extra box of cookies in your rack, the whole crew knows it. <laughs> they just figure that stuff out. Uh, All right. But we always looked at the ship when we were doing drills. No pre-disclosures. No pre-disclosures was the big term. Don't let the crew know we're about to go right. to a drill. That's what but, I wondered. 
but when you've got 5,000 people, you're flying planes, operating machinery and reactors, uh, it's hard to hide that you got to run a, sure. a drill on the ship. Sure. Priscilla, you've got someone? Well, there's been a lot of jargon this evening, and I heard two of you reference the bunny slope. What <laughs> on earth? That's a Carl. Carl? I take pride in being able to stake the claim that I'm the one that invented that term as it's used on the midway. It's a very technical term. <laughs> yeah. One of the problems we immediately ran into as soon as the ship came pier side at North Island was that Getting around the ship was a severe challenge. This ship was designed with 19-year-olds in mind, and we quickly figured out that you can't possibly get masses of ordinary visitors from the hangar deck to the flight deck using the internal ladders that the crew used to get to the flight deck. And so, Mac is scratching his head, for trying to figure out, anticipating the problem, because we all figured everyone's gonna wanna go see the flight deck. How are we going to get hundreds of people up there? And I built a model of the Midway. It was about 20 feet long, and it's currently at Petco, but at least I got to be familiar with the shape and uh, architecture and some advantages the ship offered, and I suggested that we have a ladder built that would go up from the sponson up to the flight deck at that time, I was suggesting where the flight deck kind of pinches in when the angle is formed. They decided to cut a hole in the deck anyway. But, and I suggested that we install what I would call a bunny slope because the other problem we ran into was that if you take a look at these ladders that we inherited from the Navy, they're all rather steep. They're better than 45 degrees. You really have to know what you're doing to go up and forget about coming down if you got a kid or somebody. And I suggested having fabricated ladders at key points at a more shallow angle. And I borrowed the term from the sport of downhill skiing. The introductory novice slope is known as a bunny slope. And guess what? The term stuck. And now even professional firefighters are using that term. <laughs> and, and the one that Carl, the one that we use it most commonly with are the not Carl talked about ladders, you know, less steep than Navy issue. But the, sta the civilian style staircase going up to the flight deck, that's the most commonly area, common area that we refer to as the bunny slope. And, and many places on this ship, we've spent a lot of money literally cutting through the decks uh, to create civilian style staircases and elevators. There are all kinds of stories, uh, you know, we opened without an elevator. Uh, for the handicapped and grandpa and strollers. So access oftentimes was much more expensive and time consuming than actually restoring a space to get, you know, for people to enjoy. Uh, but thanks to Carl, primarily the civilian style uh, staircase, we call the bunny slope. I call it the CVM concept where the ship is now, has a new mission and where possible you do have to adjust the ship to accommodate her new it's mission. It's a balancing act between authenticity and the fire department and our guest, you know, experience and so on. Ivy, Priscilla. Priscilla, do you have one? Yes. yes. For fire suppression at sea, did you use salt water or fresh water? Mm. Oh. Salt water. You had a question. We had, a, we had plenty of it. <laughs> <laughs> Has someone thought of a way to spray some of the water that the, some, the firefighter is holding the hose, spray the water on him? so it could keep him cool. I know it would interfere with his vision, but I'm sure they were some kind of goggles, glasses. What we learned is that try to keep the firefighter dry because if the firefighter got wet, it actually heated the water up and steam. it turned it to steam, steam and you would start cooking yourself. Wow. Yeah, in, uh, in my time we had, we were trained where you had to have the primary hose team that was using high velocity fog but you were supposed to have a team behind you with a low velocity fog applicator. Basically, it's a six foot pipe with a gooseneck and it would shower, uh, drizzle over the, the primary team to try and keep them cool. So you're actually trying to attack a fire with a two hose team, one to try and do something with the fire with pure water and the other one with uh, a little uh, 
fog nozzle uh, to try and keep you cool while you're t uh, fighting the fire. The trouble is you got, you're trying to organize two different teams to work together in a dangerous situation. And then as we find out, you're actually steaming everybody up if you're in an enclosed space. Wow. Ivy? The, the, gen the gentleman in the middle um, referred to Charlie fires. So how, how do you define the difference between an Alpha Bravo and a Charlie fire? An Alpha is uh, a, a wood material. It's something that leaves ash, um, cardboard, wood. A Bravo fire would be a fuel fire, jet fuel, diesel fuel, uh, DFM. The Charlie fire is any electrical fire. And then uh, Carl mentioned it early, a class Delta fire, which is a special fire which would be uh, the, mag uh, the wheels on aircraft were made of magnesium. Uh, once they got burning, uh, the, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna put them out. So anything with a D was a, uh, a special case fire. What do you mean you're not gonna put them out? What happens? Uh, once magnesium starts burning, you can't put it out. You can, you can use all the whole ocean. It's gonna burn until the magnesium is expended. Wow. What are the fire pumps on your typical aircraft carrier versus a destroyer? What are they rated at GPM wise? Uh, the, the, the typical rating is 1,000 GPM. Uh, the DDGs right now, they have six fire pumps. Translation, all rated translation at. please. What's a DD? We don't know what you're talking about. I you two do. I, I qualified all you people already. <laughs> Clearly we failed. You should know that already. A DDG, a destroyer, a tin can, a, what other words are there for that one? Escorts. Escorts. There we go. I knew we had one more. Um, the, most of your fire pumps are 1,000 GPM. Uh, some of your steam turbine uh, fire pumps would be rated at 2,000. But the, the typical, uh, the minesweeper, those fire pumps are 250 gallons of water per minute. And uh, we had three. Uh, DD, the destroyers have six fire pumps. Uh, the Nimitz had 18 electric fire pumps. Uh, here I think we have 22, I believe it's 22 or 21 fire pumps and uh, a bunch of them are, are uh, steam, but a lot of them are electric. John, Does by I answer, I answer your question? Yeah. John, by comparison, do you know offhand the water pressure on a, your standard urban fire hydrant? Well, the hydrant? Yeah. Well, the hydrant that is, we see, you it's know, anywhere from 50 to 150 uh, pounds, but it's the, uh, it's the pumps job to take the volume from the hydrant oh. and then boost it up to an adequate pressure. And what is that in a city urban fire department? Well, they're contract. 1,500 GPM pumps and uh, that's, at a, that's at a 20 foot uh, draft. The uh, standard hose line is uh, two inches in diameter and 200 GPM at 100 pounds nozzle pressure. Wow. Ivy. Hi, Scott mentioned uh, earlier about the flying squad incident. Mm -hmm. uh, are there more details to that or? Carl, you want to do a short version uh, of Japan, 1990, Tokyo, flight ops? Yeah. That, again, uh, like I mentioned with the, the other conflagrations that are earlier, any time you have a significant incident, it's usually a confluence of several separate unfortunate events that come together in just the right way to produce that kind of tragedy. In the case of what happened in 1990, was that this ship was built in World War II, and so she's a very thoroughly constructed, highly compartmentalized vessel. They deliberately did that to make her battle-proof. Well, the problem is it doesn't really lend, you, lend itself to further drastic modifications, which is what Midway went through to stay up to date with changes in aviation. That included the installation of steam catapults and later an upgrade to having our steam accumulators to give extra punch to the steam catapults. That means you only have so many ways of running the steam lines coming out of the fire rooms where the boilers are to get it to where it's needed on the flight deck and you also need to be able to have the ability to pump fuel to various fuel stations located on the hangar deck and up on the flight deck. And so because of the constrictions you had with the Midway's design and trying to force fit a new design with two incompatible steam and uh, fuel lines, they wound up having the two spaces, the two uh, lines in proximity to one another in a tight space. 
And what had happened on that day was that they were transferring jet fuel and they accidentally overtopped the tank. And so the fuel, it's got to go somewhere, it went back up through an overflow pipe. Unfortunately, that pipe had some uh, issues. It had holes, it had corrosion, and now it's starting to get some pressurized fuel back flowing. We wound up having in this tight space where you had both a steam line going to that accumulator right over there and a leaky fuel pipe very close to one another. And so this fuel started to pool on the deck in this small space that's already saturated with the radiant heat coming off of, even though it's a lagged pipe, a steam, a steam system. Nobody in his right mind would have a fuel line and a steam line that close together if you could avoid it. The problem is Midway's tight design forced the engineers to come up with that, and they got away with it for a very long time. They ran out of luck when that corroded pipe allowed that fuel to come down onto a very warm deck. And what happens when you warm up fuel? It starts to change its state. It goes from a liquid to a vaporous state. And, and it turned out that the steam had been so strong in its temperature that it actually, they believe in the investigation, if I, if I remember correctly, exceeded the flash point, right. the theoretical flash point of that fuel. Why didn't it just detonate? Because the space was so small, it had actually oversaturated the available oxygen in that space. And so what happened eventually was, is that when the flying squad came in to deal with the situation, and there's some debate as to what the motivations were, and I'm not gonna touch that tonight, they did have to open the door. Trouble is, what did they do when you open that door in those conditions? Backdraft. You just introduced a fresh source of fresh oxygen air. to get the right mixture for ignition. You need, what, 21% oxygen to sustain most combustion? Those poor people did just that, and you had an instant, not just a flareback, a blowback. The first detonation distended the bulkhead. It had so much pressure coming out, although that was the, the path of least resistance, there was still enough push with that blast that it actually distended the bulkhead. You can imagine what it could do to exposed personnel. So it's just one of those confluence. If they had, had a different design, if the steam pipe had been in another place, if uh, they hadn't been running the fuel to overflow capacity accidentally, if they just shut off the steam and let things cool down perhaps. It's just funny how you wind up having individual things that if they were taken care of at least once, you wouldn't have a confluence that caused a kind of problem like that. I would have answered that in one minute, but Carl did such a better job. There were actually two explosions, and I don't recall exactly 15 minutes apart, or I shouldn't even guess, uh, but there was actually a, a second one. Uh, and I've, I should know this off the top of my head, I believe three crewmen died, uh, two immediately, and another one died. 85, 90% burns over his body about a week later. I think in Houston, they flew him to the US uh, and he didn't make it. Can you tell us about the hot papa suit that's up there, please? That's an ARF suit, aircraft rescue and firefighting. And it's commonly known as also as a proximity suit. So what it's designed to do is reflect radiated heat from the flames. How well, does it do it very well? Can you get close to a bad fire in that thing? Yeah, you can get very close. For a period of time? I mean, yeah, it, it, it's actually pretty good. You notice that um, most of the heat comes from the flame front. And the flames, as they get larger, it increases on a logarithmic scale. So the higher the flames, you know, the much greater the temperature. So this does, a pretty good, this does a pretty good job. It's not an entry suit. It's not designed to actually go in and, and be exposed to the flames. Like I said, it's a proximity suit. Hmm. Good question. If anyone so, knows Dave Hansen, I keep thinking he's in there. <laughs> <laughs> he may be. He may be. <laughs> Priscilla has. Yeah, I've got a question. Uh, when I was a kid, there were training fires uh, putting fires out at 32nd Street because I could see uh, black smoke out there. When did they stop that? John? Or, or uh, not soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> I went through that firefighting school. That was, you know, that was when they actually took uh, diesel fuel and set it on fire 
and then sent you in there with the applicator nozzle to put it out. <laughs> I think I lost 20 years of my life in that, that firefighting trainer for sure. Uh, I, it was, I think it was, the, uh, it was the early 90s, I think they shut that down. You guys are being played because it was dangerous, because it was rigorous? What, what? Uh, atmosphere? Unsafe? No, it, it, it put out too many uh, hydrocarbons into the atmosphere. So Were now the new, the new trainers oh. are, all, are all natural or propane, natural gas or propane. Yeah, and our damage control assistant was the CEO of that, uh, that uh, school at the time of the transition, and he was very critical of the fact that they shifted over to what amounted to a barbecue grill, a gas barbecue grill, to simulate the fires because it gave the kids a false sense of confidence and how easy it was to knock down a fire because when we went through that, and I almost got cooked by it because the flames actually got underneath us uh, when we were on the grating part, you are fighting a genuine Bravo class fire. No kidding. And, and it won't go out if, you, if they just decide to turn a switch. You have to put it out. That's part of your class. Because if you don't, someone else is going to have to go in and take care of it. I think we have a great idea on what San Diego Fire Department does. But by definition, somebody on board the Midway has to be the first responder. So what happens, and pick your own scenario, but, but there's an incident, what happens on board the Midway? I would say the first thing is life and limb. We've got to get, God forbid, we have guests anywhere close to it, get them away. Get the space isolated as best we can, considering the condition the ship is in. She's, she, you know, if we tried to set zebra, we'd have a lot of holes still. So try to isolate, report, and make sure that we get everyone in the proximity out of there and get guests off the ship. And when Carl says report uh, from an employee standpoint or someone, you know, somewhere, basically we're all told to use our judgment. If, we're, if we have any doubts whatsoever, dial 911, just, just like at home. Call the fire department. Immediately thereafter, someone ideally either on the phone or with a radio calls our safety lead. Uh, and, and they're trained and they coordinate with the fire department. They need to know what's going on on the ship. And they basically will then, I think, take over the decision-making tree from that standpoint. But if you have any doubts, don't wait to try to find somebody else. Dial 911. And we all talk about it internally, hopefully. Uh, I know in our in marketing department we do that, uh, whether it's a, a shooter or a fire, if there's some problem, where do we go? You know, uh, depending upon where the location is, do we go up toward the flight deck, do we go to the second deck or whatever? And of course it varies depending upon the ship, where you are on the ship. But first and foremost, report. Report, and then uh, all, all our contingencies, we have an emergency Alex, guide book yeah. that all uh, crew members are issued yep. for uh, any scenario. So it's all thought out, pre-thought out in here. That's and in my in-basket on my desk. Yes. We talk about bomb threats, fire, you know, 10 different primarily scenarios. Ivy. Um, I had a question since uh, the modern Navy seems to have a lot of nuclear powered ships. Does that present any unique challenges um, or strategies for fighting fires on nuclear powered vessels? Uh, nuclear powered vessels, only the nukes go down there and fight it and I use the word nukes, anyone who's qualified to work in a reactor. Um, I spent many years on nuclear powered ships and I only got, down, got to go down to the reactor space one time. Uh, and it's, it's truly amazing how immaculate the reactor plants look. Uh, a 20 year old ship, the reactor plant looks like it's brand new. They are meticulous. I had a profound new respect for how how attention to detail they are down there. But if there is a reactor problem or anything with the reactors, only the qualified people that are trained and, and are, will attack the fire down below there. Makes sense. Ivy? Yeah, my name is John Setsky. I'm a member of the safety team. As far as your question about the first responders, uh, you see us all over the ship, uh, red hats, red jackets, red shirts. Uh, we are the first responders for anything that may be going wrong. Uh, we're the ones responsible for keeping people safe on the ship. Uh, we're first responders if there is a fire that to uh, try and keep people uh, we do hold in place first before we know what's going on. And then when we know what's going on, we make a decision what we're going to do. 
Uh, but the first thing is to keep our guests safe. That's our first primary duty. Uh, we're the first responders if accidents. We call the fire department, we call 911, and uh, while they get there, we're the ones who take care of you. I feel like I had to say something because so often people don't recognize the, just because we're red hats what we do. But that's our main job is to take care of the ship, take care of our guests. And uh, I may be a little biased, but I think we do a pretty good job at that. Thank you, John. What advances have been made in the last few years using remote control, installed systems, robotics, ability to use cameras to diagnose problems, to get guys off the hose a little easier, or have to prevent people from going after fires? Can you bring us up to date on what's out in the fleet now? Uh, what's out in the fleet is uh, what, what you see here above you is sprinkler systems in all the spaces, and that's one of the things they are incorporating in a lot of the new ships is the, the sprinkler systems and the berthing. So just like the buildings, once it hits a temperature, I believe 150, it's going to sprinkle. And then when it sprinkles, it's going to set off an alarm. There'll be a flooding alarm. They'll get multiple alarms sent to command and control. But the Navy's trying to move towards ships that are more technical, where they don't have to have so many uh, bodies to attack the fires. We had one fox, the commander, telling us he had 120 bodies to throw at the po problem. Well, the Navy's trying to downsize in manpower. I know there, there was testing on the Shadwell with robotics and that, um, but the latest technology right now is, is sprinkler systems and monitors to feed someone at a command and control s station. And on Midway, it's the same thing. One of the very first things when we talk about adding a space or a public space of any sort exhibit uh, to the public route, the very first question we ask is, is it sprinkled? Meaning modern day standard uh, kind of a system. And, and with the safety team we have, and we have a great one, there's a lot more monitoring and central alarms and systems and drills they conduct at eight in the morning before everyone gets here and that sort of thing. So it may not be to the level of the Navy, but there's a great deal of that kind of work that takes place here on Midway before anyone from the general public standpoint is allowed to, to walk into it. Speaking generically, um, do they ever use like, compartment flooding with agents like Halon anymore? Yes, Halon is still be, being used today. It's still on all the uh, DDGs. It's still on the... Um, we now the, know those are destroyers. Yes. Uh, but Halon's uh, being phased out, and they're uh, phasing in a, uh, it's slipping my mind right now, but it's, uh, it's not ozone depleting. Halon depletes the ozone, so they came up with a new chemical. I can't, I can't say it right now, but they, they have replaced Halon, and they're slowly phasing out Halon. Tell them where Halon came from. <laughs> Halon, believe it or not, was actually developed as a refrigerant. And they managed to figure out that it was an effective firefighting uh, element because it interferes with the fire triangle. That's uh, fuel, heat, and oxygen. 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 And somehow, they, haven't, they didn't really figure out how, but somehow Halon broke up the connections that formed the fire triangle. But it has all kinds of residue problems. Ivy. Yeah, you guys are putting out tons of water every minute with a uh, thousand gallons a minute or whatever it is. And this gentleman over here talked about getting the water out. How do you get the water out when it's in an enclosed space? Uh, submersible pumps, uh, eductors, installed main drainage. So there's multiple ways that uh, to get water out while you're fight fighting the fire. Um, one of the things we learned is if you're setting a boundary to say there's a fire right below you, the max water you want to put on the deck is one inch. You don't want to go. If you have to put more water as if it starts creating steam or getting hot, you have to figure out a way to get rid of that water before you apply more water. And if you want to see what happens when you're not paying attention to how enthusiastically your firefighters are dousing a ship, go home and take a look at what happened to the liner Normandy when she had a fire when being converted to troop ship duty in 1942. Normandy is as big as the Midway. And 
you'll see some spectacular pictures of this magnificent luxury liner rolled right onto her side, right onto the pier terminal in New York Harbor. That's what happens when you don't pay attention to the free surface effect that you get from excessive firefighting water. Does he know his stuff or what? What did I tell you? <laughs> Pulls that out at the end of the night. Well done, Carl. That's a true story. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> Any final questions? There's plenty of time you can come up and mingle and, and ask anything individually, but if I don't see any more hands, last call. Thank you all for coming tonight. Please thank our panelists. Dave, you guys were great. Thank you very much. Thank you all, and we'll see you in a few months at the next Live the Adventure installment. Good night. <laughs>